there are a number of cardiovascular outcome uh, trials still underway. And uh, I guess I wanted to ask how those differ from the EMPA-REG uh, outcome uh, trial. And so there's a, you know, a number of Declare, Canvas, Devote, uh, several others. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about what we hope to find from those, uh, you know, what some of the unique features of them are in terms of study populations and, and ultimately what they might um, uh, get us in terms right. of knowledge. So we, what we hope to find is that every SGLT2 inhibitor is marvelous, wonderful, <clears throat> and magical for people with diabetes. Would make life simple. Now, we may not. Uh, and so uh, Canvas with canagliflozin is very, very similar to the empagliflozin trial. And so we can sort of say we expect to see similar outcomes, although let's not count our chickens before they're hatched. Declare um, the trial with dapagliflozin is a much larger trial. Think about 17,000 versus 7,000 people. And since this is a numbers game, it's done in a population which has about uh, 30, 40 percent as great a likelihood of cardiovascular outcomes per individual. Um, so that's wonderful in the sense that it's a trial which might allow us to extrapolate benefit to a larger population of people with diabetes, not those who already have cardiovascular disease, but it also raises the possibility that it might be a so-called negative study. It might not show cardiovascular benefit because perhaps the benefit in people who are kind of pre-heart failure, and we'll talk about heart failure later, but perhaps that benefit is not going to be seen in people who really are not anywhere near that stage. Um, and so there's, it's opened up a whole set of questions now. How strictly must we insist that a trial be positive in order to allow one to explore subsets, to look for benefits within subsets? And this is a somewhat of a philosophical question for statisticians, but a an, an extremely important one. So uh, Canvas is going to be presented in June of this year, so maybe, maybe two months from when we're taping this uh, discussion. And as uh, Zach pointed out, uh, he's spot on. Uh, the two main issues will be class effect, yes or no. If it's yes, I think we'll all breathe a sigh of relief. If it's no, we're really going to have to scratch our heads and say, is this, it was Emperor outcome a fluke? Um, or are there differences between these compounds? Uh, Canagliflozin has a little bit of SGLT1 effect, and that may or may not uh, be beneficial. Um, the other issue is this notion of expanding the effect to a primary prevention cohort. Uh, we may not understand that until DECLARE, frankly, uh, in 2019, because DECLARE is a huge trial. It's 17,000 patients, as uh, Zach pointed out. And I believe two-thirds of the patients have uh, no overt CVD. Remember, in EMPA-RE, everybody had mm -hmm. cardiovascular disease, uh, whereas in Canvas, I think a third do not, and in DECLARE, two-thirds do not. So we'll be able to uh, answer that question. It's a bit of a double-edged sword, though, isn't it? Because if um, w one thing we didn't talk about was this uh, very early divergence of the event curves in EMPA-RE, and I think that may uh, point us in, into the direction of why the drug has benefit. In most atherosclerosis trials, uh, blood pressure trials, lipid lowering studies, when the drug is effective or the strategy is effective, the divergence of the event curves, in other words, the patients on placebo versus patients on active therapy, tend to separate uh, at about 12 months. And that, in our somewhat naive understanding of diabetic heart disease, suggests that there is an effect on atherosclerosis that we're, it takes a while for that effect to occur. In Empereg, Again, we were shocked to see that it was almost at month two or three that the cardiovascular mortality curves began to diverge. And if you look at the heart failure hospitalization rates, they almost diverge in month one. So that, in my mind, I'm not a vascular biologist, but that can't be atherosclerosis. It's either coagulation, which the drugs don't have any effect on uh, clotting, uh, or some hemodynamic effect as Bob alluded to in terms of the diuretic capacity of these medications. So getting back to this notion of primary versus secondary prevention, 
if, if you really have to have heart disease to benefit from an SGLT2 inhibitor, and that actually might be true. You have to have a diseased heart, uh, either known ventricular dysfunction or uh, about to develop ventricular dysfunction to benefit from this drug class. The primary prevention cohort may be completely neutral, and that may uh, eliminate the overall effect in these trials. In other words, the primary endpoint, which is a pooled endpoint, both primary and secondary, may be negative, but when you analyze them separately, you might see an effect in the patients with overt CVD and neutral effect in the patients without CVD. So it would be very interesting when these studies come out. And, and the other thing that's probably <coughs> worth pointing out is, uh, as you described, the, the divergence of the curves with the SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, in the LEADER trial with loraglutide, uh, it followed the pattern that's typical for atherosclerosis, that the, the curve separated at 12 to 18 months in that range, suggesting that, that the GLP-1 agonists are acting maybe more in what we would consider a traditional atherosclerotic mechanism. And therefore, that may have benefit, you know, in, in anyone that is at risk. It's just a matter of a duration of time and how high their risk is, whereas these drugs, which may really work specifically on people that are diseased, so to speak, and, and need that volume depletion or whatever the mechanism is, uh, may only work in people that, uh, uh, that are uh, in secondary prevention. But I, I would bring up a caution, which is that in order for the, the curves to diverge at month zero or month one, we're talking about a tiny number of individual events. And so all notions of statistical reality are out the window. So I would simply say lots of people with diabetes do have heart disease. If this proves to be something which is applicable to our patients with diabetes and heart disease, not to the rest of those with diabetes, it still will be a wonderful benefit. So Dr. Snow, I wonder if you could discuss the FDA's decision to add a new uh, impaglia flow as an indication to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death and how have payers responded to this change? What are the clinical decision-making implications? Well, I, th I think you've heard already some of the challenges that a payer now faces in trying to make a decision of is this drug effect, in which case for the right population, those with proven coronary disease, this would be the drug to use, or is it class effect? And is it all patients with diabetes or only those with you know, pre-existing heart disease? So these are research questions that are still you know, in the process of being answered, and somehow in this, um, in the meantime, there needs to be a decision on coverage. So I think that the decision is still pretty broad across um, the payer landscape. I think different companies um, um, you know, are, are tend to have um, approved um, or preferred therapies, and so I think that that's still holding true at this point. Um, but obviously, as time goes by and more data comes in, um, and we become smarter about what do we know about these drugs and what do we know about class versus individual, that will drive um, which direction coverage decisions go. But if Canvas does not show benefit, and if <laughs> Declare does Let's not show that benefit, <laughs> then it would be awfully difficult for any company to justify not providing empagliflozin for the patients. Because for that patients would- patients with, with known heart disease. With known heart disease, right. of which there are right, so many. Right, of which many. <laughs> so many. So, uh, you know, it, it, at the moment, we, of course, we have to say we, we have to learn more, but we're never going to be able to disregard uh, the Empareg findings. Right. I mean, that we know. And so, at the very least, there is now data out there about a population of folks who clearly got a benefit with a particular agent. And now, really, the question is, well, um, is it unique? And is it unique to that population? Um, and, and we'll know more. Fortunately, this is not a theoretical question of there's, there's in the next coming. 10 years, as opposed to we will, even within the next couple of months, we will learn more. And depending on what we see you know, over the next couple of years, we will be much better informed.